Welcome to Design Talks Now, hosted by Design Pavilion in support of NYC by Design and New York City's international design community. I'm Eileen Shaw, producer of Design Talks and Design Pavilion, New York's public design exhibition held annually in the public plazas of Times Square. With the mission to increase public awareness of design thinking, the process, and projects. This series is our virtual response to the COVID-19 shutdown. Our desire is to serve our design community with a platform for consistent communication and sharing. We're interested in what's on your mind and what matters to you now. Design practice is one of flux, always observing and bending and shaping with the times. The world just drastically changed in many irreversible ways. As a thinking industry, we will identify and meet new needs. We're here by documenting our experience during this extraordinary time in history. You are contributing to this time capsule as well as inspiring what will come next. Today's panel of educators recorded this presentation on May 21st with the intent to air on June 3rd. This talk addresses the foundations of our current institutions on the basis of the exclusion of marginalized groups. The panel's acute insight is astounding and their concerns and dedication to change is clear. And they appeal to our community and call us to action. Between the date of recording and the attended airing, George Floyd was brutally publicly murdered by four policemen in Minneapolis. Preceded by too many black men and women murdered across our country by police who were never brought to justice. We canceled this event last week in grief and in solidarity of the fight for justice equality. And now we are here. Addressing Making Room for Joy, we welcome moderator Jennifer Rickner and panelists Alan Chochinov, Emily Baltz, Ari Melanciano, and Sloan Leo. Please listen carefully. Keep in mind it was presented two weeks ago and put it into today's context. I think you'll agree it's remarkably insightful, sensitive, and spot on. And then join us at the end of the presentation for a live Q&A discussion with the panelists. You'll find the link right on this same webpage. So for now, Let's begin. Hi, I'm Jennifer Rittner. She, her, daughter, sister, friend, neighbor, cousin, niece, wife, parent. Also educator, writer, and strategist. I've studied and worked in some pretty cool places and been lucky enough to make a career out of doing something that gives me joy, which is to talk to people about how art and design connect us to people, places, times, ideas, identities, and communities in every way imaginable. I can pinpoint three early moments when I began to realize the power art had to transform crisis into connection. Back in 1986, when I was living in a somewhat constant state of crisis, a woman who became a mentor to me took a group of us girls to Storm King, where I first encountered this work by Isama Noguchi. I don't have any pictures from that day, but I can tell you that memory is indelibly edged. The chaos of that time was made more bearable by having experienced that place and that work. The second is when I first saw the work of Kay Walking Stick when I was still in college, and she was exploring ideas about biracial, multi-ethnic identity through her canvas that felt like she was reaching out and talking to me directly. And the third is Dr. Ray Alexander Minter, who, as head of education at the New York Historical Society, used art and artifacts as tools for raising really complex and inclusive conversations about who we are, how we make meaning, and how we interrogate the basic assumptions of our relationships to one another. 
So to me, joy is about connection to those objects of beauty and those ideas about meaning. And it's in the work of my own kid who makes art so easily. It shows up in photographs taken by friends and family. It's in institutionally sanctioned work that hangs in galleries and museums. It's in objects that rise up out of fevered imaginations and those that have been buried for the afterworld. Some of it is inherently joyful and some of it is dead serious. It speaks to pain and hope and the many ways in which beauty is made manifest. Where politics are divisive, art is connective, even and especially when it offers a provocative point of view. So for me, art belongs to everyone and it's a source of joy that I turn to at every moment of crisis. Anything you love, anything that makes you feel whole, that's where joy lives. Hi, my name is Emily Baltz. I work as an experienced designer, new media artist, and educator with a focus on using food and the senses as mediums for embodied experience. When not in times of pandemic, my studio is in the New Lab, a space in the Brooklyn Navy Yard dedicated to exploring how technology can be used to improve the human experience. My present work is inspired by this context as I create speculative objects, interactive experiences, installations, and pedagogy that use both digital and human technology to reconnect us to our bodies through acts of play. Alongside my studio practice, I teach an experience design course named Design Delight in the School of Visual Arts Products of Design MFA program, where we explore how embodied experience can be designed to get people to engage with topics like abortion rights, black birth justice, family relationships, national identity, personal identities, and also future identities. Uh, Now on a personal note, I wanted to share with you something I recently delighted in making, these two gifts for a friend's child. On the left, you see some New York City clouds made out of a shower scrub puff, and on the right, a piece of Brooklyn sky uh, cut out of a swim cap. Now, I'm not sharing these because I like to craft, but because I adore the process of spending time in a dollar store trying to think of new ways to use everyday objects. There's a joy for me in knowing that what something is may not actually be. And in my work, I try to expand the application of what that means, looking beyond the traditional outputs of design to create experiences that explore the intangible aspects of human life, what motivates, inspires, delights, and creates meaning in our everyday. Hi, my name is Alan Chachanov, and I'm really happy to be here. I'm the founding chair of the MFA in Products of Design at the School of Visual Arts in New York City, and I'm a partner of Core 77, an online network serving a global community of tens of thousands of designers founded in 1995. My early design life centered on medical design, concentrating on HIV and AIDS in the mid 80s and creating surgical instruments, diagnostic equipment and consumer products and health through the 90s. I was lucky to work with a lot of leading companies designing products, platforms, software, and strategic foresight. My current concentration is around design education, where I work with an extraordinary faculty and staff mentoring our graduate students at SVA. Our program just completed its eighth year, and we've helped steward projects around myriad subjects, including equitable maternal care, women in the military, reproductive autonomy, the political discord in the United States, reimagining the rape kit, prosthetics, limb loss and limb difference, stop and frisk, and tattoos for protest. We also nurture the lighter sides of design education, fostering delight by designing products for the Museum of Modern Art, learning how to solder and code smart objects, traveling up the Hudson for retreats with local farmers, and generally making a big mess in the studio. I really love this picture. I have a lot of hobbies that I spend a ton of time on, and these bring me great joy. And I take great joy in participating in this event. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sloan Leo. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm the Director of Social Innovation at the VAD Group. My work is rooted in community in what it takes to survive together, to thrive, and to find collective resilience. 
Over the last decade, I have traveled more than 250,000 miles all over the country and the world. I have spent tens of thousands of hours teaching and facilitating at NYU, at the School of Visual Arts, at Princeton, and at institutions that represent innovative thinking. I have designed and managed over 100 board meetings, met thousands of people, and been fortunate to gain millions of insights into what it takes to build and strengthen communities. After many years of grappling with the capital D field of design, I found a home in the practice of community design, where I've been able to focus and hone my skills, point of view, and expertise in designing community building strategies and systems that can be applied inside organizations. I've taken a very cross-sectorial approach in the application of my work, and I've applied my concepts and frameworks in venture capital, the corporate social responsibility space, grassroots and multinational nonprofits, public and private foundations, and with individual philanthropists and social entrepreneurs. As a leader, manager, or advisor, my commitment is and will always be to facilitate and steward the building of meaningful connections, which isn't magic alone. I spent the majority of my career as a relationship manager, better known as a fundraiser, part confidant, part friend, part psychologist. My work was to understand individual motivation and collective success. What I've observed is that whether you're a funder or a staff or a grantee, there is an aching for a similar tangible connection to something larger and a better future. And isn't that shared ambition the essence of community? I think it's time to redesign some of our cherished and oldest organizational habits in the nonprofit sector. And that's what I use my skills to do. Hi, my name is Adi Melanciano. I'm an artist, designer, creative technologist, researcher, and educator who is passionate about exploring the relationships between various forms of design and the human experience. Much of my research considers the human computer interactive potentials of imaginative uses of technology through physical computing and creative coding, designing virtual environments and thinking about architecture through the web, creating experimental pedagogy experiments where I'm combining audiovisual experience with critical race theory and understandings about the world and society, thinking about future of blackness, future of culture in general, and what that even means. Uh, and I'm also the founder of Afrotectopia, a new media arts culture, black culture and technology festival that thinks about how technology can be used to mitigate racial disparities that often practices speculating on designing futures that are equitable, racially equitable and sustainable, um, and shares research at the forefront and in intersections of art, design, black culture, technology, and racial activism. I'm a, an educator and I teach at New York University and at the Pratt Institute on technology and design and society. I'm Jennifer Rittner, she, her, and I'll start by offering a land acknowledgement which was co-authored a few years ago with Curtis Davia of the American Indian Community House. Despite being connected in virtual space, we hold the mandate to acknowledge the lands on which these programs are made possible. So while we have the privilege of convening virtually around the imagined space of Times Square, establishing our intellectual, social, cultural, economic, and technological dominion in these spaces, we also have the responsibility to acknowledge that this city and this program, New York City Design Week, are founded on the exclusions and erasures of the many indigenous peoples of Manhattan. The land of the five boroughs that make up New York City are the traditional homelands of the Lenape, Merrick, Canarsie, Matinecock, and Rockaway Nations. Despite systemic erasures, these lands persist as intertribal trade lands under the stewardship of many nations and over 115,000 intertribal Native American, First Nations, and Indigenous peoples who currently call New York City home. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism, which is our collective ethical responsibility. In addition, I acknowledge those of us here on this panel and perhaps even in the audience whose ancestors did not arrive on these lands of our own free will and whose tremendous cultural, economic and technological contributions continue to provide the foundation for our collective and connected enterprises. So to continue this, 
We are going to forego the colonized tradition of listing credentials and professional accomplishments of our panelists. But I am going to ask each person to state the name of one person in their life who has taught them about joy. So can I ask each of you just to speak the name of that person into this space? And I'm gonna start by acknowledging my childhood friend and neighbor. Her name is Charlene Coleman Waters, and she gives and receives joy like it is air. Can I ask Ari to uh, continue this? Uh, I'll say Virginia de los Santos, my mom. Emily? I will say Joe Baltz, my father. I'm yeah. passing to Alan. Um, let's stay within the family. I'm going to go with my wife, Victoria Brown, who has, uh, the sound of her laugh is like the most joyful thing I could ever imagine. So. Oh, thanks, Alan. Um, I would say one of my best friends, Abby Raphael, who hosts amazing community events. She shows me a lot of what joy can look like, even in times that are hard. Thank you. So when I first submitted ideas for this talk, the topic was about designing delight in times of crisis. And that topic may seem obvious right now, as we are all thinking about COVID-19. But importantly, I proposed this topic back in February when this pandemic seemed a little bit more distant. And in fact, I was thinking about crisis in a very different set of contexts. And I'd like us to hold on to some of those contexts as we begin this conversation. Because for many of our communities, COVID-19 is just a compounding of existing traumas. It's just one more thing uh, that many of us are already dealing with. The crisis of violence perpetrated against us because of race, religious belief, and gender presentation and identity. These are crises that have been compounded by the pandemic as resources and care seem to be less available to those of us already marginalized by insufficient access to medical care, shelter, income, and even just plain old goodwill. The crisis of a lack of credible political leadership and the embracing of political division and a stated purpose of backward movement embodied in the word again that has compromised our body politic and in many cases our physical and psychological well-being. The crisis of climate change and its adverse effects as always on people who lack wealth who continue to live in areas that are most vulnerable to the effects of environmental devastation. The crisis of over-incarceration and the forced separation of families as a result of criminalizing Blackness. The crisis at the border where legally sanctioned violence against migrants and immigrants has ensured that generations of children will live with trauma that because of current policies will never be addressed through adequate health care, education, or community support. The crisis of school shootings that have traumatized children of every age, which we have found respite from in the past three months only because school buildings have been emptied. The crisis of wealth inequity, educational inequity, legal inequity, the crisis of depression and mental illness, sadly, this list could go on. So crisis may feel more present for more people now, but it's important to acknowledge that as designers and design educators, we have responsibility to understand the uniqueness of this particular crisis alongside the chronic and acute traumas that people have faced and continue to face in our communities and around the world. So with the framing of crisis now set, we have the understanding that this conversation will address the role that joy plays as one ingredient in a designed response to those conditions. And while I've defined some of the challenges, I'm going to open it up to our esteemed panelists to center solution building. So I'm going to start by asking you to say what delight or joy means for you. Uh, let us start actually with Sloan. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for, for that thoughtful opening. And I'll reflect that my definition of joy and delight in my practice of community design is really rooted in unnamed, uncelebrated, and unsung individuals. So I could quote to you what Tim Ferriss says about design, which is that design should be good in that it has delight and utility, but what actually really comes home from my practice and my day-to-day -day experience is really around the way in which queer people of color in my life particularly those who are in positions of leadership, not often kind of granted or accepted, embrace both resistance and delight. And so I think it is not about separating the two, but actually seeing the way in which joy and delight, particularly in times that are difficult and arduous, can act as a source of nourishment and relief. So I think for me, it's really been that um, in my practice, but also in my life. Thank you, Sloan. Emily, can we take that over to you? Sure. Thank you as well. 
it's an absolute, I mean, I'm going to make the pun, but it's a joy to be in this conversation with all of you. My own definition of delight and joy, I think, uh, come from an interest in how we design a state of being for all humanity, for all humans. And something that has always struck me in the definition of delight is a beautiful quote that I often take inspiration from, from the poet May Sarton, who says, whether success or failure, the truth of a life really has little to do with its quality. The quality of a life is in proportion always to the capacity for delight. And the capacity for delight is the gift of paying attention. And I think that in these times, we're obviously forced to pay more attention to our daily lives, to our relationships, um, to who we are and to how we show up in the world, to what we have access to, what we don't have access to. And so I think that there, there are these parallel definitions of delight that actually ask us to change our way of being, to pay attention to our daily habits, to the design of our everyday lives. And that for me, I think, is quite inspiring and also quite challenging in the context of whatever is happening. But as designers, it's also something that we're implicitly trained in. I think at heart, the practice of design is the study of human behavior. And if we start to take a lens on it into how, how we delight in that, I think it has less to do with happiness, which is quite a singular, and in my opinion, almost a fabrication now of capitalism, that there is some kind of single moment entity, product, service, whatever it is, that will deliver this thing called happiness. And instead, maybe a shift, the collective shift for all of us um, through a lens of delight, which is, I think, also rooted in the presence of our being and the presence of how, once again, how we show up in the world and, and a presence in terms of what we make and what we pay attention to that starts to craft the stories and the meaning, therefore, of our lives. I would love to build on that, actually. First, it's just, it's a real honor to be um, on this panel with um, everyone here. And thank you for that wonderful introduction, Jennifer. I really resonate with what Emily was saying about attention. You know, for me, like, I've just long argued that attention is actually the currency. And what we pay attention to, um, in many ways, defines us. You know, the other thing that's mentionable is I think a lot of people think about delight or joy as something uh, frivolous and in some sense effortless. The, those are the things that come without effort. Um, and for me, like what animates me is service, actually making things hard, like working hard at something, paying like, you know, very, very sort of consistent and careful attention to something. Um, and for sure, that's what gives me feelings of, of joy and maybe maybe sometimes pride but there is there is a real sense of delight if i think about it and so i want to contrast this notion with something that again is frivolous perhaps effortless perhaps that just it comes to you if you if you let it something that actually you can nurture and cultivate in your own life uh, through like commitment thank you Ori. Thank you, Jennifer. It was a very grounding intro, and it's nice to hear all of your, um, each of your ideas on joy, and I feel like I relate to many of them in thinking about how I define joy, and it's not something I exactly think about of what is joy, but when asked, I, I think about how I often feel most joyful when I'm present and in tune with myself and the world around me, and um, similar to what Alan was saying, of it's sort of like a and not realizing the sort of effort that you're putting into it. Like when you are doing something and it's not, you're not thinking about the performance of it or the skill that's required, you're just doing it and it's coming out naturally. So I think joy is often just being a human, as a human being, just being a human being physically present in the world and operating. And I think there's also joy in realizing things, as also Alan said, of overcoming challenges, like putting yourself through something or um, attempting to learn something that you don't know and finally realizing that you're capable of doing that. I think realizing and learning more about yourself in ways that can feed yourself and you can grow off of this a very joyful thing. And also just being around love and people that you love, doing things you love, being in a space that you love, whether it's internally or externally. I think those kind of things, again, it's a, a sort of in tune with yourself in the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think that those are really helpful ways of, of sort of understanding how we're coming at joy for ourselves personally and in practice. And I'm curious to hear each of you talk about 
when you are thinking about designing in, in this way, who are you bringing into those spaces with you? What does it mean to identify the, the principal beneficiaries of joy in your practice, right? Who, who... I actually want to jump in here. You know, I think this is one of the incredible traps in design. Um, that we have this idea that we can design agnostically, that we can design for everybody. And for me, really the valuable design is the specific design to designing for particular kinds of people, or particular uh, problem spaces. And again, you know, the first thing and we can get into this is that requires sort of extraordinary humility. You know, it might require empathy, although I think there is an empathy backlash in the, the world of design right now. But the first thing it requires is that that is not your reality. And for you to be able to contribute, to offer some sort of design offering for a person, a group of people, um, a subculture, a culture, really necessitates uh, fresh eyes. And even that, like, you know, isn't sufficient. I've seen so many design projects go bad because uh, there was like, you know, two weeks of immersion that was put in that make people feel like, oh, now I understand uh, this group of users and I can design something for them. Uh, and, and as I said, originally designing something that's agnostic, that's gonna help everybody uh, is for me like near ridiculous actually, to put a big word on it. Yeah, I, I'll just jump in and say that I, one of the things that I've been thinking about over the last year or so is the distinction between practice and performance and this idea that there's a kind of performance of empathy, it, empathy being the, the one uh, thread I would like to pull from that, is that there's a kind of performance of empathy that actually isn't put into practice. And so there's the idea that you can sort of like gather evidence of how other people exist in the world and yet you never really develop a full um, and complete understanding and so the, the performance of empathy leads to design that I think remains very superficial and that you then do what I think Emily is pointing out, which is you turn the idea of delight, which is about embodiment and about a sort of completion, right? A sort of um, deeply felt set of, of modalities and you turn it into just happiness. Right. And so you stay at the surface rather than to actually address what are the deep seated ways in which we feel deeply connected to one another. Jennifer, you had asked a question, I believe, about the moment we're in and Alan had answered it by talking about humility. And I actually would like to zoom out for a second to some of your earlier analysis about crisis. And I think it was so thoughtful and right on. And I also wonder a lot about crisis as framed as the experience of marginalized or oppressed people only. And I wonder a lot about what this crisis is like for people who are in positions of privilege. And so if we look at the idea of outsider and like who can look and say that group is in crisis, oftentimes it's because you're not in crisis. So how can that be an opportunity for designers to say, oh wait, I have the space to reflect, therefore I'm not in acute crisis so I can be more available. And I think that the other part that I'd like to mention about this idea of humility is that humility is somewhat based on the idea that you are an outsider with expertise coming in who must be humbled and kind and gracious to the community you're entering and respectful. And I must say that I think my design perspective is quite different in that I'm really interested in how do we actually use design as a tool for community capacity building so that rather than trying to fight for authenticity through a thoughtful design process, the authenticity comes from equipping those who are actually experiencing the challenges to say what they need and then to ask for help where they need it. Yeah, and the shorthand in design is, is to design with as opposed to design for or design at, at its worst. Yeah, and I think that having a clear sense of what that shorthand looks like in practice is really critical for us to move forward in a fair pace and a way that is durable and creates durable lasting change. Yeah, the opportunity now is to build new kinds of design capacity and really participants in it, as opposed to new solutions for new problems. I also think there's a chance to look at the innovations coming out of the space in social justice and movement building in organizations and individuals fighting for justice to be thinking about how are those innovations. I think sometimes we get in the habit of saying the new thing will be better, but oftentimes there are old ideas that because of the political or strategic context, didn't have the chance to breathe. And so I hope we have more time for that now, for old ideas to become new, particularly from communities that didn't always have their ideas centered. 
So I'm curious to hear how you think we do that. I mean, how do and how do we um, how do we bring that kind of thoughtfulness into design practice more broadly? I think about it in terms of rhythm, tone, and substance. So I think that designers need to think about the pacing of their work. Most of us and those folks who are watching, I imagine, run small studios, work in house, and have clients that need to be prioritized. So how can you in the rhythm of communication of a work plan, acknowledge the very real fact that you have a six month contract for a certain amount of money, but also give space for conversations that may not be able to be wrapped up in a 20 minute conference call. I think about tone and intention. Are you able to start off by saying, my intention is to practice co-design so that you as a group can hold yourselves collectively accountable for when that behavior doesn't happen. And I mean substance in that we've gone into the habit of do-gooding in this agnostic way, without a political lens analysis point of view or position. And unfortunately, or fortunately, we are no longer in the state of the world that allows for political ambiguity, centricism. We actually need to push for progressive values now more than ever. If we ever were. Mm -hmm. I would build off of that uh, Sloan, of especially this idea of intention, because I think good intentions can easily result in harmful effects. And I think people can think that they have good intention, but they're not very aware or even honest with themselves of what their true intention is. So I think a good dose of self-awareness and understanding where this intention is coming from. Agreed. You know, one of the things that I, I had been also thinking about was the subversive nature of, uh, of what we're talking about is how do you embed ideas about joy and, and self and agency and, and self-directedness and self-authority into design. And I think Sloan, that that is a part of what you are talking about, which is that the designer sometimes has to get out of the way in order for the individual and the community to actually determine their own path, right? To define their own sense of joy, right? It's not something that is given or received. It is something that is activated perhaps. All right, I'm curious in, in the design of Afrotectopia, if any of these ideas were kind of bubbling in your mind as you were thinking about developing that program. Yeah, I think um, Afrotectopia, the festivals have been for two years. And for anyone that doesn't know, it's a, a while I was a graduate student at NYU in the, a program called Interactive Telecommunications, where I'm learning about technology and design and art and engineering in tandem and experiencing a sort of isolated experience racially of not a racially diverse community of people, whether it's students or faculty. And then the issues that we're talking about, about technology don't consider race and different cultural communities. And so after Tobia kind of came out of that, of a lack of community and a lack of recognition of how race plays a really big role in technology. And I feel like the way that Aftertopia has grown has been also pretty reflective of where I am at the moment in understanding things like critical race theory and blackness and whiteness and all those things. And I grew up in a place that's predominantly black um, and a place that's very special to grow up as a black person and that it, it has a lot of privilege. Um, so you kind of are blindsided. And I feel like generally in the time of me growing up with the Obama era, you, a lot of people kind of thought race was a bit different than how it is today. So in entering this program and in learning a lot more about blackness and critical race theory, the first time around, it was very reflective of the times. It's very much a, a protest of how homogenous, racially homogenous the tech field is and um, how people aren't really considering people of other backgrounds and how the social impacts of tech. That was pretty much the focus of the first one. It was very much, let's diversify tech. But the second one was much more about, let's go beyond just diversifying tech and um, being the sort of pipeline for uh, sometimes or very oftentimes toxic work environments in the tech field if you're a black person but let's be more about a community of people that are designing a future that we want to live in and be a lot more speculative um, and be the ones that are creating this world instead of waiting for other people to do it and I think the second time around and having a much better understanding of uh, kind of activist practices that are not responsive to the current times but much more forward thinking and designing a place that we want to live in and having that agency and feeling the permission to do that, I think was one of the biggest shifts in kind of how it was practiced. Emily, I would love to bring you in here. Thank you, Ari. And I, and, you know, let's acknowledge that we're all educators here as well. So part of what we're asking is how do we bring this into our practice as educators? And what does it mean to be in a classroom trying to teach 
students of design how to not embrace the idea of designers as saviors, but actually as co-equals, as co-participants, as um, co-interrogators of spaces. And I wonder, Emily, if you can talk about what you've been doing in your classroom and how you're bringing the idea of joy in as this much more complex um, sort of uh, space. I think maybe to foreground some of this, I teach a class called Design Delight in Allen's Products of Design program at SVA. And specifically the class has, uh, I think maybe a snarky little subtitle, which is designing for non-needs. The, the language around design, I think, is um, incredibly insightful and unifying in terms of practice. It also, I think, like all languages, has its sets of constraints and problems. And I think that I've always wrestled with the fact, with the, I think, the definition of design as a, as a problem-solving discipline, because the word problem implies a solution. And I think in my own experience of life and in my own experience of the world, that a human being would presume that they would have a solution is actually, I think, a somewhat egocentric point of view. I think that to borrow, I think, a little bit more language from you, Alan, you've often talked about flows, designing flows and negotiations. I think of it um, as a former dancer as choreographies as well. How do we become more in symbiosis with the world? How do we become more in balance with it? Those are languages that I find somehow more authentic to the way that the natural ecosystem works, as well as to how we design relationships, successful relationships within human beings, within culture. And so that slight shift of the lexicon, that shift of the lens is what I try to bring to my own teaching. And in a practical way, how that shows up is borrowing often from the performing arts, from spaces like improv, from spaces like dance, that are embodied practices. I wouldn't necessarily say that delight is an embodied experience. I think delight can show up in a lot of ways, but I think in terms of creating experiences or services for people, for users, and also for makers and creators, one of the most powerful ways is to begin to embody things. And I also want to state that that's not new for designers. Uh, designers are trained in making prototypes, right? Things, stuff, uh, body storming, acting out a scenario. And all those tools are there to get us out of ourselves. And I think that there's a little bit of a, there's some finite nuances here also in the relationship that we talked about before of performance and practice. Because a performance is a practice of being. And it's a way to train ourselves to adopt a new behavior, to have a new mindset, to do a pirouette, <laughs> to be able to ski down a mountain at super speed. You know, those are super classic, I think, age old techniques that humanity has used to allow ourselves to externalize ourselves, to study ourselves, to see ourselves, not as individuals, but as collective human behavior. So when I teach and through this lens of delight, it is not about happiness. It is not um, about pink bunnies or I think a lot of things that, that marketeers co-opt and have done so in the last few years specifically. But it is more about entering into a practice, as I said before, of being. And there are some simple and practical ways that I would call exercises even more than, than practice. And I also think that there is maybe a little bit more digging into the word joy, because I would also say that I don't think joy and delight go hand in hand. Joy, if we start to dig into its etymology, also has a lot of spiritual roots and spiritual quotations and associations with it. In those contexts, you know, agnostic of beliefs um, or cultures, there is a definition of joy that implies hope. And I think that the notion that we're talking about right now, maybe in its root, has more to do with a bit of a dance between creating possibility and presence, hand in hand. And when we experience that as humans, there is a thrill, like you can feel it, you can sort of shake and shiver like, oh, you mean it might not be the way that I've expected. That does all sorts of things neurologically. It also does so much in terms of creating a sense of positive creation. And, and advancement. And I think that those are emotions and a, a kind of emotionality that we might wanna reflect on when we are creating products, systems, services, relationships, 
those to me are thematics that are that are hopefully universal throughout all human experience and that we could i think do a better job of integrating into our lives and professional practices hmm. so i've been teaching i've been a, the designer in residence at the school of visual arts in the dsi program for the last six months and to hear you say embodied practice is very heartwarming it is how my students and i think about community building as a contact sport you know, it really requires showing up and participating in the process. Um, and as I think many people on this panel have said, being present. Delight is, designing for delight is a, it's an invitation. It's an offering, it's a gesture, but it is an embodied practice. So if design becomes an embodied practice and the designer is actually a facilitator or a steward um, or a chaperone of sorts there to be as a guide. And so I think if you think of that role, then there's ways of placing delight if you are a steward of delight in your practice you know i don't design products i design systems for community building and organizations but so maybe there's more room for delight in my type of play but i also imagine that for all the folks on the panel today that there's an opportunity to do even more of it yeah i love the idea of design as a contact sport and the, and i think that you know one of the things that embodiment does is it it requires a recognition of difference because nobody embodies anything uh two people cannot embody any experience in the same way and so the role of difference in this requires us in the classroom as well to to understand the different lenses that our students are coming in from, right? That we all have different starting points, that we all have different contexts, that we all have different forms of, of touch, of sensory experience. And so how do we also mechanize a kind of process then for allowing students to be their whole selves, to bring their whole selves, and then to recognize the wholeness of others, right, through embodied practice? Alan, I think maybe you can jump in. Yeah, I mean, this is an absolute obsession of mine, you know, coming at any design uh, problem space, you know, you're laying out the different stakeholders and you feel like you're being very insightful when you uncover a stakeholder, but that's very, that's still, you know, like very othering. If we pull back even one step to the question, how can we actually welcome and provide some agency for people, let's say on the design team, in our case, in a, in a design class, to actually show up, um, even culturally, because a lot of our students are international and Canadian, um, and we will um, we will participate differently. We will sort of show our own point of view differently. One of the the things that I've been doing for several years, I've shared with lots of lots of schools, is having students present in their own language on the third class of a new semester. This is this is it has it's best when it happens early in a in a program when the students don't really know each other yet, but they've in some sense pigeonholed each other. And so I have them present in their own native language, but like English is not allowed in that class. And I do it on a, on a class where there's something visual, you know, on the screen. And there's lots of takeaways from this. I mean, everyone understands everything perfectly, frankly. Um, but what happens is that we see people, and the expression that I use when I talk about this or write about it is at full power. That when they're in front of the class and they're presenting their work in their own language, you see them at full power. Uh, and then of course, disallowing English in the classroom provides a kind of uh, deprivileging of, uh, you know, people who actually talk a lot and might not deliver too much from a de design perspective. So it takes away like that crutch. I mean, it accomplishes a lot, but one of the, the, the biggest things is that it allows the, the group who is this forming, right, this new group, let's say that it's around three, three, week three of a two-year program, to really see each other differently. Um, and again, this, this, this opportunity to show yourself differently. And I'm not saying that if you speak in your own native language, that is your authentic self, but I found that it's getting, it's getting closer. It's also super fun. And to this topic, it's unbelievably delightful. I mean, there's just a lot of laughter. So I recommend that to anybody. Um, and this is one of the ways that we're able to, to put these ideas into, into practice in a very, very replicable way. So I would love with that in mind to, for us to shift a, a little bit and say, what is the change that we would like to see happen right now? I mean, what is the change that we want to see? If not societally, that's a big, that's a big one. Um, but in terms of practice of what we would like to see our colleagues 
educators and designers doing as a matter of, um, of, of actually uh, creating some kind of a practical change. And for me, there's like, there's always like a tension between like personal point of view. We actually literally have a course called point of view. Um, and, and, and like this audacious, um, like gesture, like to put out some sort of design speculation that comes, you know, very often from an individual that isn't a result of a collective effort. And that, you know, there's a, it's a, like almost a kind of a call and response. And then there's like early signals to that. At that point, it maybe become a little bit more co-created. And so there's really, there's a, a tension always for me between listening, like uh, uh, Petrula Vontaika, who I quote all the time, she said she works with her ears. She's a graphic designer in California. And so, you know, working with your ears or working with your mouth and like pushing things around. Um, so for me, like that's always a, a tension and, and certain, uh, certain teachers are actually better at, you know, cultivating these things in different, different students. It's not predictable in my experience either, by the way. It's, not, it's also not the only two sort of, you know, ends of a measuring stick, but I think that they're useful. Yeah, I would want to build on um, the ideas of pedagogy because I feel like the classroom experience uh, and us talking about design, it's so much more than even being in the process of designing. It starts, the design experience is the entire thing. So when a student enters your classroom, that's part of the design and how you greet them and how you talk with them and the way that you all are engaging. For me as an educator, it's important for students and it might come from the fact that I've been teaching throughout my entire career. Like when I was I left uh, undergrad, I was teaching high schoolers three years older than them while being three years older than them. So kind of this proximity to my students in age, it also changed the way that I taught because for one, you, you do have to designate a sort of um, level of respect so that you're not considered one of their friends, but it also allows for this openness of them realizing that you are also someone that's learning from them. And I think one thing that needs to be changed in the classroom is this um, idea that the teacher knows everything and you're kind of um, trying to be what the teacher wants. And I think also to go back to um, hope inside of a classroom and design, I think one of the best things about being an educator is that you are showing students what they are capable of doing. You're showing them what's possible. And I think part of the design process is being that person that is showing the community, this is possible, like showing the vision. And design is not is also not just the person that's the sort of nucleus of the operation, but they're the person that is bridging people together. It's an interdisciplinary sort of initiative. You're showing the people that are in your community, um, each other and the things that you all are capable of doing. And I would also say that um, something I would love to see in the world, and I think something that might be happening, I think even as a result of this pandemic is a sort of decentering, decentering the people that we think know what they're doing, whether it's a country, a person in leadership or a continent. And um, in this time of being in quarantine and observing the world, even watching things like there's a, a really interesting Apple TV show called Home. And it's just showing people from around the world building their environments. And I think it's there's this one that takes place in um, Asia and they're building homes out of bamboo. And it's so much more sustainable than a lot of the materials that we're using today. But even as you hear them, the practitioners that are building these homes use their material. They even look down on their own material because it's not Eurocentric. It's not something that um, right. European people are practicing. So I think, I, if anything, I hope that people really value their culture and their own practices, whether it's recognized by Euro people at all. Yeah, you have to ignore the mirror, like, often. Yeah, I'm really moved by that. I have to say, this language um, that my brother and I talk about quite a bit around guilty pleasure, and this idea of feeling guilty about liking something that you, that you enjoy because it hasn't met a certain mark of cultural relevance, right? Or it hasn't been acknowledged. And I think that when we do that, we, we diminish ourselves. And so how do we hold up the things that have value to us simply because they have value to us? Not because some external measure has, or some external force has determined what value that thing has. And I think that is something we can bring into the classroom, which is really tricky because many of our design classrooms are still centered on the idea that Ameri or European modernism is like is the beginning and the center point of all good design. How do we dismantle that? And I think that really toxic notion that everything somehow has to plug into our, our this common idea about design excellence and modernism. There is also such what's been practiced for so long, even um, 
stemming a lot from Eurocentric practices is this idea that the human is um, different from everything else in the world. So there's a lot of design practice that's done without considering the entire planet. And I think for one, there's so much design that could be practice that is considering how the world is designed, the natural world and the way that biomimicry can enhance, whether it's our architecture or even learning environments like Oct Octavia Butler using slime mold as a sort of guiding light for so many parts of society. I think those kind of practices need to be. I'd love to build on that as well, because both of these, I think we're talking about them in I'm all, this whole conversation, right, is, is also being addressed in quite theoretical and, and, and practitional terms, let's say, for lack of a better word. Um, I think there's also, there's a real reality right now that we're facing as a planet, and that is our economies and the way that we've defined commodity. And design is most implicit in that. You know, I think that we can have speculative design, we can have pedagogy of design, all of that is interconnected. And when we talk about the change that we want to see in the world, I think we have some harsh realities to come up against is that we've built for ourselves to function a commodity based system. So what what do brands do about this? What do companies do that employ hundreds of thousands of people? The change management that's needed in that, I think, is is dramatic, is overwhelming. I have like zero answers for that right now. But what I do sense is that there is this moment that allows us to start to reflect and ask ourselves, what is our definition of value, right? And we've been talking about it, I think, as practitioners, as theorists, as critics. But what about as consumers too? And, and as product makers, I think that there's a real shift that I would love to see. That's a reconsideration of those values, hopefully more humanist as we've talked about, borrowing from indigenous practices and as well as from completely radical new speculative futures that we don't even know. I think that's, you know, it's also a huge, <laughs> that's a huge question to throw in there. But at heart of this, I start to think about how are we in the business of creating value? As people in our own homes, I think a return to the domestic has also been forced on us, but also reveals a lot of power and the power that we have to shape our individual existence through the kind of rituals that we design in our own homes and in our own spaces, whatever they look like, wherever we live, we have that agency as people um, to design that. And so there's an interiority to that question. And there's also an exteriority to it in terms of how, how are corporations going to respond to this? Um, and how can we maybe do that in symbiosis more than before? I, mean, I think it's an incredibly important question and I'm, I'll put it to the panel, which is, first of all, do we think that this is a moment that change will happen in these spaces that we're talking about in commercial spaces in terms of our, our relationship to the other uh, objects that we value, to the experiences that we value? Do we see change happening or are we going back to the kind of again? Are we looking to go back to old practices or do you think that there is actually a path here for meaningful change? You know, Jennifer, I think this question in the context of like, what does the future hold or how do we look forward together? It makes me think a lot about the fact that change requires relationships that are deeply held and based on trust. And when we think about the pace of change, you know, they say that relationships move at the speed of trust. And so I think that part of today's conversation towards the future has really been about power and how do we shift the locus of power? How do we share power? If delight can be used as a tool to build relationships and those relationships allow us to get through harder conversations faster, I think that's really where I would put my money for now is on really building those individual relationships. And you know, our firm doesn't work in the private sector, we work in the social sector where you would assume that those bonds are already existing. But what we've actually seen over the last three months alone is a willingness to listen to each other better, to be in more intimate dialogue with people across your organization, and ultimately to be working in a place that's much more honest about a power dynamic that will need some shifting over the coming decade. I might, I'd also like to add to that, that I think a lot about you know, where I mean, human beings, <laughs> the reason that we're here now is because of our relationship to power. And often our relationship to power is our relationship to fear as well. Why we seek it, why we eschew it, all of this. And so I think there is an underpinning in that, that there's, there's an emotionality to all of us as beings. And to facilitate that transit between them, right now we're being forced to be present because we don't know what the hell is coming next, right? 
And that's creating eruptions, conflict. It's also creating moments of incredible heart aching beauty. Like, I mean, I'm inspired by the way that humanity is actually being resilient right now, right? There's lots of shit that's going on. And there's also incredible moments of wonder that move me to tears. So the hope within that, I think, is that how do we embrace all of that, all of ourselves, not to be cliched, but, you know, like, love all of you <laughs> and, you know, and, and be there, be there together, be present in those moments. And I think that to your point, Sloan, that experience, the more and more that we can practice it, the more and more then we're able to build trust, the more we're able to have a relationship to fear. And maybe then the more our constructs of power start to change. I'm, I'm really very deeply um, moved by the idea of bringing more emotionality into design practice and into the way we teach design. And I think that, in fact, this is such a, an interesting way of thinking about the disconnect that we've maybe instituted uh, for a very long time that says that uh, there is a kind of a, this sort of objective reality. Oh, like it's we literally call our, our audience users. I mean, how worse could it get? Right. Right. I mean, and that's right. The language of that, right. This user, this right, it's utility. And yeah, so how I think this, this, the value of bringing the emotion into the work to be not just passionate about it succeeding, right. Cause people feel very passionate about success, but to be passionate about the feelings that are embedded in the, in the making and the thinking and the doing asking and the failing and the the retrying right that that emotion i think could be something we could really bring into practice in a more meaningful way i mean er earlier we had talked about like the currency of attention but one of the things that i i try and explore you know with students with faculty is just this notion that if in if participation increases things get better like more participation more better and I'm trying to, in some sense, like keep a tally of like all the different things for which that is true. And sometimes I wonder if that's true for everything, despite, you know, what I was saying earlier about like the power of the individual and the power of the individual point of view. When more people are involved in something and, you know, to allude to something from earlier, you know, nature wants diversity um, and more participation, depending on how you, you know, slice it, may increase the odds of more diversity. Uh, in, in every way defined, and I think more better. Um, so for me, like a lot of, and this goes to a lot of the course that Emily teaches, which is all about interacting with people who are not involved in the initial sort of prime mover, you know, pull the, pull the lever of the design intervention, but animate and actually put information into the design experience that she nurtures the students to create that then become the actual design, you know, and I'm putting putting methodology into your mouth here, Emily, but in terms of creating an infrastructure of a scaffolding for a design experience is part of the craft of the course. But the the beauty, the joy, the delight of, of the, the payoff of that is when it is populated by participants. And the more the better, frankly. And that's when you, you know, when you're able to and again, I don't want to be solutionist and say, you know, that's when you're able to measure the success of the design intervention, because it's not really about that. But I think that you can actually, it will reveal or it will surface some of the amazing things that come. And Emily, back me up, the most incredible, like, you know, there's sort of a difference between outputs and outcomes. The most remarkable outputs are the ones that the that the designer never expected. Like I never thought that somebody would get this out of this experience, and so that the outcome is as revelatory as it is for the the designer in this case, right, the prime mover, as it is for the participant who actually spent time in this you know designed or creative or constructed space and time experience. I almost feel like the word that we're not using here, but feels important is catharsis and that the experience takes you from one state of being, whether it's anger or sadness or even just happiness, just being um, into some feeling of change. And I don't want to use the word transformation, but I think catharsis actually, to me, gets closer to it. Emily, does that kind of resonate with what Alan was describing? Yeah, I think there's different timbers of it. For, for some practitioners, there's catharsis. For some, there's transformation. And I would say the same for the participants who experience our work, right? There, And I think the, the greatest the, at the heart of this idea of delight is that 
and all of us are representative of this on this panel, right? Everyone is deeply personally involved in their work. I, I can speak to this from my own point is that it, because it's a holistic learning experience then, and there is a constant uh, catharsis, <laughs> transformation and education that goes on of knowing myself by, as a person, as a practitioner through making. Maria Montessori famously said, the hand is the instrument of the mind. Um, and that's what you know, I continue to return to. And when we're in these kinds of frameworks, I think, as creators, one of the great challenges is um, both to trust yourself to create a system that is resilient enough that other people can enter into, clear enough, navigable enough, you know, those are practical terms. Um, and then also trust yourself enough to be able to observe, listen, look, and learn from the work. Improv involved. Yeah, it's always a, it is always a yes and, like that's the only way to make it enjoyable. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think, and somewhat pleasurable, not in a classic way, but that you're also present, you know, you're present as a maker is the other half of that equation. Like the great, great work is because the people who are making it are paying attention, right? They're, they're interested, they're present, they continue asking questions, not because there's a solution desired, but because there's a quest to find kind of the end of the tunnel of a, of a, of a question, yeah. I think, instead of a solution. I do have one question, and Sloan, it's for you, because in terms of my lay knowledge of queer theory is the queering of systems. And I think, I'm curious to know if that's part of a language for you or vocabulary yeah. or an approach, which I think resonates, for me, the little bit that I know about it seems to have some application to this conversation. I'm, I really appreciate you raising up the idea of like queering design and queering, um, all of this work, particularly systems as like a community systems designer, obviously that's where I would focus. But one of the things that's been interesting is I've been going to a Tuesday night queer critical theory discussion night for the duration of the pandemic. And one of the parts of that conversation that feels very resonant and relevant right now is just this idea that um, in the kind of hidden corners of community, in the unspoken, that there are really profound you know, innovations and so for me, it's really been about how do I create space when we're working with an organization or a foundation for those voices to show up. And the querying is actually about the power and the shift in whose voice is prioritized, who is involved in a decision, and who ultimately benefits from the system that's being created. So I think if the querying of systems is still about the querying of power, and I really appreciate you raising that. What is feeding you right now? What is the thing that you are discovering in your own practice that is changing, that you want to bring um, with you as we reemerge? What is the thing that you wanna see have changed that you're not doing right now? And I feel like for me, that list is a little bit endless, um, but I will start by saying that I've, I've really tried to get out of triage mode and just right? Like, I'm not trying to fix the thing that's broken right now. What I'm trying to do is find what are the opportunities for equity that I can now kind of discover new because of the challenges that we're facing. And for me, uh, in the classroom, it means using these new, you know, virtual spaces to be more inclusive and to say that, look, time and geography are no longer an obstacle to who can be in my classroom at any given time. And, and so synchronously and asynchronously and across many distances and even languages, I now really have an opportunity to bring people in who would not otherwise get heard, who would not otherwise get seen, who would not have an opportunity to provoke, who would be distant and abstract. And so I think that there's a real you know, opportunity to use this moment to reshape what it means to have a classroom, what it means to be in a space of learning. And I think that to everyone else's point, which I and I strongly agree, is to recenter how the individual is an agent of their own learning. Um, I always say an agent of their own liberation, but let's say learning for now as well, um, because that is that is the thing that I think we can do the most. And so delight for me is seeing somebody have the revelation of like, I did that. <laughs> I'm making something. I've discovered something that is cathartic and transformative and, and ultimately very personal and something only they could experience, but we can be witness to. So can each of you express something about what you're hoping can come from this moment? You know, Jennifer, 
when we were thinking about the moment we're in, what happens next, I was talking to a friend of mine. Um, she runs or ran a community event called Babe Town. And last year I ran dinner parties and my friend Abby, so like my network is of people who their craft and the material that we mold with is community building. So when there's a essentially gathering together is not healthy right now. I have found in my own practice and reflection, a lot of the interrogation of like, what is the new commons? Like, what does it mean to find space for like intimate collective relationship building if we can't have dinner together? And what I've found so far, and I'm definitely not done with this reflection is that in smaller groups, in smaller Zooms, in the mail, there are opportunities to find that intimacy again, but that they, probably aren't gonna be found in the same places as we left them. For me, going through this quarantine, um, I've loved how it's made the littlest things big celebrations within my family. So it's, it's constant engagement, whether it's video chats or some sort of celebration. I think the way that um, hopefully a lot of us are able to experience this that is bringing the people that are close to us that we take advantage of how close they are, um, whether because they're in our family or they live near us, how we're engaging with them more in intentional ways and really cherishing our relationships with each other. And I also enjoy this time of, as being someone who just loves to plan everything and have like a complete vision of all of my future, how it's really special to live and recognize that you don't have any control over anything um, and just embrace that and really cherish what's happening now. So again, again, the, this presence that we need to tune in more to. I think for me, you know, Sloan, when you talk about the commons, that really resonates with me. John Thackera writes and speaks a lot about that. So, you know, what is the commons now? For me, the personal challenges are, you know, lots of what we talked about, access, privilege, power, not going back to the way things were, not desperately going back to the way things were. I was in a conversation and I had said, you know, the, the, circle that I travel in, like the big worry is that we're actually going to go back to how things were. Like that's the topic. It was a conversation about getting back to, to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the idea that we wouldn't necessarily was a, was, you know, a challenging idea where I think for us, it's like, that is the opportunity. So it's a struggle in terms of the, the things that I have influence over at a, on a professional level, those challenging those structures, that scaffolding in ways where it, it changes uh, along the lines of what I was talking about before. And acknowledging that this is going to be difficult and that a bunch of stuff is going to get broken, you know. Yeah. I echo everyone here. <laughs> I think that a couple things come to mind in terms of the future. One is how do we as a people get comfortable in discomfort? I think that's a big one. In spaces of ambiguity and, and liminality, you know, to Alan's point, like the, the discomfort also points to a new way forward and that's incredibly uncomfortable to exist in um, and has real, you know, potential for, for psychological damage and instability and all, all sorts of things. And I think, so how do we, how do we manage that as people? And I, the other, I think, insight is the power of the domestic and of micro moments that personally I've experienced in these last months and also have throughout my whole career really been a champion of the power of specifically in my work of food experience has you know, much less to do with, with calories and ingredients and much more to do with relationship building um, and the creation of meaning in our daily lives. The invention of it, the return to existing heritage that we might have lost or continue to hold dear. As people, I think that's one of the most challenging things in these moments is sort of the existential void that faces us when we're in liminality. What do we do? How do we ground ourselves in our daily lives so we can also continue being with the people that we love we're moving towards the things that we desire, that we love, who we want to be. All of that, I think, is a real foundation of our humanity. So I personally am really interested to see what design can do for the domestic space and for the rituals in each of our daily lives. 
Can I add one more one more element in here? And I, it might have come up earlier. This this notion of care, and I, I find it's hand in hand with the idea of what what we pay attention to, what we choose to pay attention to, what we have the power and privilege to pay attention to, what we choose to care for, and what are the things that maybe now call out for care, um, or a different kind of conception of what care is. And I think that that's worth a lot of our time and consideration as well. And it, it's related to what we decide to pay attention to, because it is, in some sense, the active side of that coin. Sure, you paid attention, but what is the call to action? The action is like caring for something. And I don't have a more sophisticated word for it. I'm not sure that we need one, actually. Well, I think that to your point, I think the idea that care feels as though it's it's a diminished value is part of the problem that we have undermined what actually is a very important value yeah, and that to care is very meaningful. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, what it doesn't have is a kind of easy, clean set of boundaries around it. Uh, but I think that to go back to how we bring emotion into our work, that includes that that emotion has to connect to a, a sense of care. And I would just argue that where empathy becomes really tricky is that it becomes hard to care for people we disagree with, that we, who we fundamentally disagree with, by the way. That actually becomes a very complicated matter. And there are many reasons to design very well for people we do not like. And right? now the real panel's starting. Keep it, keep it rolling. <laughs> Uh, but they, right, and so this is a very serious thing that, in fact, one of the problems that I think we have is that people pick and choose who they will design for based on who they like and what they specifically care about, as opposed to kind of recognizing that that those boundaries have to be a little bit fuzzier, in, in fact. Um, but and, that and I think denying that things are networked to begin with, that things are atomized and you can just point to something and then go do design at it is yeah. kind of unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. So thank you all. Let me say your names out. So Ari Valenciano, Sloan Leo, Emily Baltz, Alan Chachnov. I am so grateful for all of you to be part of this conversation. I'll say Jennifer Rittner and then. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jennifer, Alan, Ari, Emily, and Sloan. And thank you all for joining us at Design Talks Now. Please go to the live Q&A session. And for those who will not meet us there, again, thank you. And I bid you to please stay safe, stay smart, seize the moment, and act up. Design stands together in solidarity and support of justice equality and all equality. See you in a few minutes. I want to thank everyone for being here. I, I especially thank our panelists, Sloan Leo, Ari Malenciano, Emily Baltz, Alan Chachanov. You met them in the uh, pre-recorded video that you just watched. Uh, and that video is, as you all probably know, was recorded a couple of weeks ago. Um, a lot has happened since then. This panel discussion, uh, this live piece of this, is also happening right at the time that George Floyd is being memorialized in Houston. And before I came on the call today, I spent a little bit of time on the live feed at the, um, through the website of the church that is presenting that memorial. And I just wanna hold up a thought that part of what we're talking about in the context of joy is the way in which our shared pain is actually a catalyst for joy. And that it is not the pain that we feel alone, but actually the fact of being in community around that pain that actually is binding us together and leading us to action. Um, I think that we have a lot of opportunities here uh, um, to be really honest and forthright about the challenges that we're facing and to recognize that the joy that we're talking about is not about convenience. It's not about the simple. Um, it's not about the thing that I do alone as an individual, but it's a way that we hold up those of us who have been marginalized by systems of design and the ways in which we can activate change through the tools we have through the tools we actually have, but not to pretend that we have greater tools than we actually have, right? That we're not gonna solve all of the problems, but that in coalition and connection with one another, we're actually able to hold one another together as we move through this. I would love uh, to ask Sloan, perhaps, I'm gonna put you on the spot. 
okay. and ask you to uh, start us off with a thought about what in your work in community action, what is happening with you in your space right now and what you're thinking about um, and how this moment opens up some possibilities and challenges in your work? Yeah, thank you for the invitation to start this conversation, Jennifer. The thing that I've been reflecting on the most has been how do we move forward together? And I feel like for the first time in my 35 years, the idea of social justice is on mainstream news. CNN last night, it said, let's fight for social justice. I was shocked. And so as we think about how we together engage in a practice of social justice, I'm really brought back to ideas of collective or community design, which is the question of how shall we move forward together? Um, and I think that we as a field have a lot of tools in our tool belt. So I'm really focused on grappling with this possibility that we could instead of thinking of it in the more of a kind of supremacist lens of how do I fix this, I think the question is how do we fix this? And as design practitioners, we understand ideas of collective generation and problem solving together because design is a practice. And I think it's time to be in a social justice practice together. Thank you, Sloan. Um, I am being reminded that I need to tell people that to ask questions, you actually have to do it in the Q&A function on Zoom. So please go to the Q&A for questions, uh, to pose questions to the panelists. Um, Ari, this question of community, this is a thing that you have created in your practice. And I would love for you to talk about what is it meant for you in this process of actually creating a community um, well, I, for one, very much agree with Sloan's sentiments of that this is going to require us coming together. Um, I think for me, uh, I've been more thinking as far as a, just an independent human being and not someone that has created a community as far as um, like reaction towards a situation. It's definitely very conflicted. Um, like I'm, for me, I'm seeing um, very inspired by all the efforts that are going on a lot of change has been realized so quickly that's inspiring and i know motivating for a lot of people but i'm also pretty concerned um just as i think sloan was saying too of like the sustainability of the efforts um and what place and what role people are engaging in in doing these efforts i think i see a lot of um information being thrown out there which is great but i also see a lot of people taking leadership positions when they really should just sit back and listen and champion the people that have been doing this work for a while. So those are the things that are really concerning um, me of who's leading a lot of these efforts and um, what they're, you know, how, how are they respecting their roles in this whole societal change? I mean, this, this is a really serious matter, right? And I, I think that, look, Sloan and I actually talked about this the other day. I am a light-skinned biracial woman in at a time when um, I also need to step back and say this isn't entirely you know this 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 fight is all of us but um, I can't be the loudest voice in the room either and so how do we get people to acknowledge and the fact that I have you know privilege of a white parent actually which is a, which is a very real privilege um, how, how do we get people to step back. What do we say to people to get them to step back? I think it's I a good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what were you gonna say? Oh, go ahead, Sloan. <laughs> no, I think it's a good question. I think it's a good question. That's it, that's all I was gonna say, Ari, you go ahead. I mean, for me, I'm, um, I'm listening to efforts that people are doing, but also um, directly addressing them and saying, you know, there are people, I mean, for one, emotional intelligence um, that can only be accessed through a lived experience is a real thing and that has to be acknowledged. Um, so there are also people that have been doing research that don't have that lived experience, which is a different kind of knowledge, but we do really have to value the people that have been living through this every day and, and may not have the words for it, but know what it feels like. Um, and just addressing people, you know, asking them, what are your efforts as far as elevating the people that have been doing this kind of work or doing it currently? And I'll build on that, Ari, just to say that I feel like right now what this moment holds for me in terms of revolutionary radical potential is the ability to tell folks who are taking up too much space that they're taking up too much space and finding ways and locations to do that that's loving and compassionate 
and invested in their long-term growth, but holding white people and white professionals in my life accountable to committing to social justice and racial change. So I feel like more brave to do that, but I also want folks around who are gonna know that they should step back so I don't have to have that hard conversation. Yeah, and I, and I think that there's this question that you even raised earlier, Sloan, around what is radical and the idea that liberation is a radical request, right, is, is part of like the absurdity and the toxicity of the conversations we've been having. Like nobody asks for, for liberation. Mm -hmm. um, it is exactly. it's demand, right? We'll say, yeah, you do. Is, is that what you just said? Oh, no, I said, well, yeah, I said, I think yeah. that you're right. I'm curious for Emily and Alan, kind of how they're thinking about this too. I don't want to take up all the time. Oh, definitely the time to listen um, and to amplify where where we can. Yeah, I would echo that sentiment. And I'm also curious, I think that there's, there's also a real need and a desire for participation. I think that even in our talk, which was pre-recorded, we had talked about that, you know, more participation, more better. And what I'm curious about too, is that it very much is as a moment in time, you know, a time for listening, a time for education, a time for learning. I also think that there's a real human need to participate and to support. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, what if, if there are other scales of participation that we can think about? Because there certainly is right now, right, like a flood of social media and that you know, as a user experience for, for anyone is like, they're big megaphones, right? And what I'm hearing is like, put down the megaphone, <laughs> you know, be quiet. Yeah. Um, I would say that the other side of that, uh, you know, at, in generosity is probably also coming from a place of a true desire for participation, a true desire for support. And what are the other ways that, you know, and as designers, I think that this is a real call to action, that we can think about different scales of service and different scales of support. Um, so we are able to amplify voices that have lived these experiences that, you know, like, are, oh, again, you know, have embodied knowledge, um, but that we are able to do this together. And, um, you know, and what I'm seeing a lot of right now is that for me feels like a space to fill. It feels like a real opportunity for contribution um, and for invention. Yeah. You know, I've been, and Hannah has a question, which I'm going to get to in a second, but I think that part of the rubric that we're dealing with in a lot of design spaces is that um, we are holding up expertise and expertise looks like something very particular. And I think that maybe we need to reinforce that the vulnerability of asking questions is actually a stronger position to be in. And so you go into spaces to ask questions, not to demand that people respond to you or, or, um, uh, uh, or, or hold up the solutions that you've already kind of built in your mind in their absence. Um, Hannah Rudin, who is actually a, an alumnus of SVA's Products of Design program, asks this question, given the context we're in, can, should you design for joy and grief at the same time? And what might that look like? And she says that she's working on a project around happiness and wondering to make space for joy do you also need to make space for grief? I would love to, um, who would like to take that? Uh, Ari, do you have a thought on that? Um, I mean, I think they, it's a duality um, that they both need to be done in the same time. You're experiencing grief and joy um, often interchangeably in, in different ways. I mean, there's a grief of a lot of different things. It could be a grief that your art isn't coming out great and you're just frustrated, or it could be a grief that you're creating something about um, a social disaster that you're trying to highlight in a more positive way. Um, but I think it's important to embrace dualities and trinities um, of life um, and to not compartmentalize. I think we're often taught to be these factory workers in the way that we are educated. And it's not that, it's very interdisciplinary and everything flows between each other. So I would say make room for all of it. And I'll build on that Ari to add that the language that is here, Hannah, around joy and grief, um, they are a duality. And the word that came to me was, how do you design for resilience, healing and celebration? which is another way of saying that, that might be a way into your practice. I also- could I, could about I add, Sorry, could I add something here? Because I think that since our last conversation, I have revisited the work mm. of Ross Gay, if you're familiar with him. 
um, a really wonderful educator, um, I would also dare say theorist, who's at Indiana University um, in Bloomington, Indiana. And something that he brings up, which is maybe a nuance that we didn't touch on, but I think, you know, skirted around too, was that, that the true experience of joy embraces naturally pain and grief, that it's a fully lived experience. And so just like by living, we true living maybe acknowledge as dying. And so within that duality, like that's the tension of our lived experience. And joy comes from that, from kind of forcing presence, forcing attention. Those are thematics that we touched on a little bit. You know, and I think that Ari also had called up in, in our conversation this wonderful uh, framework that was more about a dialogue and education, right? Learning from each other. And I'm struggling to use the right words here, but I think that there is like a, there's a relationship and acknowledging that everything is in relation to each other, which allows us to be in the moment and to be with each other. So yeah, I think the, di that, the dialectic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So those were those were thematics that struck me um, just over this last week since since we spoke together, and it felt like also an, an important contributor to bring up in this conversation. Uh, very much through historically, this has been ritualized. This connection between grief and joy, uh, homegoing celebrations are very much the nexus of grief and joy. Uh, second line parades uh, uh, and for funeral services are that, um, as are protest. And I think that if you think about what protest really is, it is, it is very much the connection of community come to, coming together at a time of tremendous pain, collective pain, and in coming together, creating joy that activates change. So we have many rituals that actually make space for both and that acknowledge that to have to feel one deeply is actually to feel the other deeply. And I think that one of the problems that maybe Hannah, um, that, that you're touching on is the ways in which so many of our design touches on the superficial, right? That we're often designing for convenience, which convenience really is not, uh, I, I would argue a very deep, um, meaningfully, meaningfully felt, uh, condition, right? And so we should not be afraid to tap into these spaces that are that are ma that make us feel vulnerable, and the ways in which we can ritualize that. I wanted to add in a little tidbit. Um, joy and grief are nouns, and I think it's always been really useful, certainly in in my education career, to concentrate on the verbs and not on the nouns. Um, and I think that that might be helpful here. I think that you could, Jennifer, you touch on it in terms of the rituals uh, that we develop. These are actually doing things um, versus describing them. Um, and I think that that can always be uh, instructive and inspiring. I think that's a really helpful point. Like when you said that, Alan, my brain was like, right, healing is an action. You know, it's like the idea of this is to think about, again, we're designers, so what's our practice? And practice is an action. So I really appreciate that reframe. With that in mind, do we think that maybe that one of the things we can activate is um, to not be afraid of pain, right? To not to not rush too quickly to salve, right? To to gloss to to move beyond pain, but to actually allow for moments to be fully in it. And I wonder if part of what we can ask as design educators and design thinkers is like to create more mechanisms for people to actually work through all of the feelings and all of the sensations, um, all of the steps, the stages of grief and pain and discomfort, um, not to simply, again, sort of elide it to get to the next thing. Like transformation doesn't happen just because we jumped. It happens because we've, we've really pushed through the muck. Um, how do we allow for that to happen in, in collective community ways? I actually think that's a great question for Ari and Emily, and I'll put them on the spot as a colleague to say that, in the talk and in our kind of musings, we discussed biomimicry and the importance of having a biomimetic approach feels like it's resonant in your work. And I wondered if you could think with us about that because I feel like you have a real sense of this idea of organic versus inorganic form versus linear. Uh, thank you, Sloan. But what Joan was saying of, um, I was hoping you would say discomfort because I think that's a mm. really important thing that we need to not be so quick to uh, throw away and just find ways that we can feel comfortable in this time. And I think a lot of our actions, that's what, that's what makes a lot of us um, pretty worried about how sustainable this is, is because, you know, we're watching people, myself included, trying to find ways that we can feel 
comfortable and return to our comfort in any way that it was, even if it, it lacked um, comfort compared to other people, just return to something that we feel more comfortable with as soon as possible, as opposed to doing a lot of that work. Um, and so to your question, um, in thinking about biomimicry, I was just reading about, uh, I don't know where they're located around the world, but they're an indigenous group of people that um, they have one of the first forms of democracy. And <clears throat> the way that their democracy works is they are using a water filtration system through natural kind of design. So it's like a, it's an elevated form of water filtration system, maybe on a mountain. And so each village, they have their own source of water and they all have to cooperate equally because if they don't, then the water won't be safe for anyone to drink. So I think um, biomimicry is really important to think about how social groups can operate where everyone can be taken care of. And I think right now we're in a world where it's too easy for some people to just remove themselves from what everyone is dealing with, but still be the ones that are in charge of the democracy and everyone else suffers. So I think it's also just sort of a quality that mimics um, the way that biology works. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Monaco Tamura, who is also, hi Monaco, also a, a, an alumnus of POD. Uh, she says, I really loved how Sloan said, since delight is an embodiment of relationships, it can be a vehicle to shift power. Yeah, I love this subversive aspect of design, but too often I hear this talked about as a potential and not how it's manifested in a certain project. How have the panelists managed to incorporate this in their projects? Is this a hidden agenda that they sneak in or do they have strategies for aligning teams, clients and other stakeholders around your vision? Yeah, great question. Thank you, Monaco. Uh, who can we, hmm, who can we put on the spot here? Oh, I don't know if I wanna call somebody out. Does somebody wanna volunteer? I'm happy to take the fall on that one. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is a great question. Hello, Monaco. Um, this is something that I personally seek to champion in my own work. Um, and I would say in uh, one of the main points that I usually address is narrative, linear narrative. So uh, linear narrative is a traditional structure, you know, age old structure of telling stories and making meaning. Um, it's expected, it's how we relate to the world classically you know, as human beings, you know, beginning, middle and end. I think on a practical note, like we're all in the business of storytelling, right? And, and right now is such an amazing time for telling new stories in the world. And so what I usually look at as a practitioner is um, what are the structures of storytelling that I'm using and, and try to break classic and traditional forms. And what that does is it creates very simply surprise. And when we do that, well, it's unexpected, it's unknown. Um, and storytelling comes in lots of ways. It comes in you know, speech. <laughs> it also comes in the props that we use, um, in the colors that we choose, right? In the, in the flows, in the organizations, in the user experience, like the list goes on and on. But where are the opportunities to shift? And I think this is both like a practical response and also a metaphorical response and an offering for everyone maybe to consider that in their own work. How do we start shifting out of classic structures and, and create something that allows us to pay attention? And when we pay attention, what that does as people is that we are present together, you know, and, and suddenly if we're all there together, looking and feeling and being, it shifts us out of ourselves. And, you know, this is not simple stuff. <laughs> and I would never postulate that I am a person that does that well either. I think it's something that I practice and attempt to do. But those are, I think, are some practical ways to start thinking about our own work, be that through, you know, experience design, product design, system design, community design, all of the different, you know, industries and categories, like where are we able to break traditional roles, traditional structures, and that, in a sense, in, you know, the root of delight is how we get to create new engagement, new forms of attention, and attempt, you know, and start to draw the spotlight where we, we want to focus attention. And building on that, Emily, the point that this question makes around shifting power resonates with me with the something you just said, which is it's an opportunity to shift power. And so I want to actually talk about the, the subversive aspect of that as I've experienced it in my work. 
Um, I have found as a person who has often had institutional authority, but socio-political, I have less power. I have found the idea of hidden agenda as an act of subversion difficult because I think it's actually about strategy. So as much as it feels dark and sinister, hidden agenda is, did I have an intention for how I need to shift the power in this moment? And to whom do I reveal my hand and when? So how is this strategy for me to build power to shift it? Is it something that I reveal to the person immediately where it may require them to go, oh God, I don't want that and react poorly. Or can I offer it with compassion and gentleness and say, we need to talk about power in this moment. You know, So I think there are ways of thinking about subversion as strategy um, and not as something that's dark or sinister, but as something that's about intention and awareness of a political or power dynamic. Um, I think I can jump in with a, with a design parable that references uh, water filtration from what Ari was saying. Um, there's this notion the, that you get a town to clean up their water by uh, putting their intake valve downstream as opposed to upstream uh, so that the water that they're getting into their town comes from the water that they're expelling out of their town. And so I really like to think about design uh, problem spaces as equations. And so often we have the ingredients to address challenges in not built in. They're, they're sort of resident often. Lots of times there aren't participants, but lots of times there are. And that rearranging the equation is a way to, uh, to, to foster change, but also to pick up on what Sloan was saying to be like unbelievably strategic about things. Um, and I love that you're saying about sort of when is the time to show your hand um, as a kind of, um, it may sound sinister as a business skill, uh, but it's also about the storytelling, Emily, like where in the narrative are you revealing clues that are gonna give you some insight into the different character development so that the story actually makes sense. Oh, that was their motivation for doing this action. Um, so it is, it's very much an equation as is, I think, uh, screenwriting, oh, not, also, on, not only, uh, an equation, but I think it can be useful. I would also say, um, building on a lot of what has been said, especially the storytelling from Emily of this question. I mean, it, it's a, such a great question. It can be answered in so many different ways. Um, but it reminds me a lot of Dave Chappelle of how he mm. can be taken mm -hmm. as someone that's very controversial and, um, says things that can be pretty offensive he's doing it in an extremely strategic way. He's highlighting a lot of racial social orders, oppressive social orders, um, and just revealing how people are thinking, but don't speak this out in public. And I think also the brilliance of comedy is putting problems in people's faces and they're laughing about it, but they're also learning. And most people don't really want to be taught where they're being lectured to. They want to be able to laugh. And I think comedy does a really great job of teaching and bringing delight. Yeah, Ari, it's the power I, of genre. <laughs> yeah, I was going to actually just build on, I think that humor and irony are two tools that designers absolutely should use in their work. I think that in terms of narrative, one of the things that I, I actually think is quite subversive, and look, I'm not a designer, but having worked at Pentagram and in other spaces where design is happening around me and I get to influence how we are talking about how identity shows up in design, is to actually normalize what has been marginalized. That actually is a subversive act. And so when I, you know, at Pentagram used to demand that they not tokenize the presence of black and brown faces in marketing materials and design materials, you know, and to normalize that, that whiteness is not a, um, to, to de-center whiteness in communications, that ends up being a subversive act because it forces people to, uh, to, to confront what they have normalized in their work and in their own perception. So uh, small acts of, of normalizing actually can be very subversive. And I would actually point to the work of another student, uh, Yang Ming last year, who talked about um, polygamy, uh, polyamorous relationship. And one of the things that I think she was really looking to do was to explore how we normalize narratives around different kinds of relationships, not to, not to present it as radical, but to present it as part of a mainstream conversation about how relationships happen. That itself is an active subversion. Yeah. To make it observable, noticeable. 
yeah. yeah, to reveal. And I think part of this idea of revelation that is actually even why I love this call right now is that as designers, we, or as design theorists and educators, we really work in layers. Like literally, if you go into a design software, there are layers and this dialogue has layers and we're saying the practice is multi-layered and that our practice should be about like collective revelation. And I think that's just, a, I think it's a really interesting frame and I really appreciate some of the points that you've all been making. It feels uh, exciting to be on this call. And yeah. the embrace of complexity, like mm -hmm. fundamentally, you know. Is there a simple, you know, there, there's also a simple tool, and I'm sorry to use this word. You called it out in our conversation, yeah. Ellen, but a user, a user journey. <laughs> ah, sorry. I love, <laughs> I love user journeys. I just can't stand the word user, but I, I, I'm I understand. I'm with you, I'm with you, yeah. yeah. User um, journeys, amazing, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's an acknowledgement from all of us as, as designers that we are like making things for people, with people. And every single individual comes to the experience that we're creating at a different level. And so Sloan, your point about layers is even looking at some, something as simple as a, as a user journey map and starting to even rethink the design of that is something that can be more layered visually, interactively. So we as designers have tools to understand at what point of access different people based on their background, their lived experiences, their learned experiences will engage with our work. And I think that really starts also uh, to also just diversify an understanding of, you know, who, what a user is, number one, and give more complexity to people. And those, I think, are some, some practical tools that would also be interesting within the practice of design is to look at, you know, even the classic form of design thinking. How could that be re-illustrated, re-articulated to embrace these new points of view that we want to put forward in the world? I'm going to pull this over to another question, um, another former student, Jenna Witzleben. Hello, Jenna. How do you think design education can support designers in learning to operate in the discomfort you are speaking of across professional and personal contexts? Um, how is and should working through discomfort be a necessary part of community building? All right. Jennifer, can we all answer that question of like how we learn to work through the discomfort? I'm very curious to hear other folks answers to that. That's a yeah. great question. Yeah. Would you like one of us to start? Um, I'd like Ari to start. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Individually, Sloan? Yeah, as a person. Um, I think for one, it's reading a lot of philosophy. Um, the ways that I've been starting quarantine is um, starting my mornings off with uh, reading Tao Te Ching and drinking tea. And I think when you read philosophy, it allows you to look at a big picture at something of something. Um, and you are often finding connections between that big picture and how you're moving through the world. Um, so being able to zoom out is important um, because for me, it's very easy to just like zoom in and obsess over the details. Um, and being very comfortable with not understanding things. I think a lot of things I'm doing now, I'm only able to do now because I spent so much time pulling my hair out in frustration because I didn't know how to do it. So I think um, being on the other side of so many experiences and learning uh, gives me a lot of hope and faith in the process. Um, but I think generally it's just a comfort in knowing that, you know, there's no such thing as perfection. Everyone is learning. Um, and to be patient with yourself. I'm going to pick it up because I actually have something to say about this, which is I think that externalizing it and recognizing that uh, that these issues are uh, can be dealt with in a way that is not entirely personal, right? And so I think actually, Ari, that is part of what you're holding up there is that by looking at philosophy, you're looking at the universality of these questions. And when you look at it in that way, you can actually take it outside of yourself and say, I push aside any sense of fragile, right, fragility. It's not about ego. Um, it's about getting to something that's new and better and different. Um, and that that is a good. And so I'm willing to be the lightning rod. I'm willing to be uncomfortable. I'm willing to have people be angry at me in order to get to something better. And I think that the um, to not be afraid of people being mad if you say the wrong thing or ask the wrong question is a really important part of this. You know, all of this talk right now about white fragility in particular, I think what it's pointing to is that people have to get out of their own way. Um, be 
vulnerability, I feel like is a question I keep coming back, the word I keep coming back to, but to be willing to be vulnerable. And if you do it as an advocate for others and see it as not just you, about you, it actually is easier um, to have those conversations. But Sloan, since you're the one who framed it as the individual, would you like to tell us how you've done this? Um, dialectical behavior therapy. <laughs> Dead serious. Okay. I grew up. Uh, I grew up with some depression as a kid. I was little and it sucked. But uh, there's this whole thing in the mental health field called dialectical behavior therapy, where I learned it when I was like 13 to 16, and it's all about literally the science of sitting with. It's emotional regulation science. So it's like the skill you learn is like literally called distress tolerance. Mm -hmm. And it's there to teach you how to tolerate distressful moments of feelings so that you can then put them at a distance and zoom out to Ari's point and sit with them. And like your own vulnerability can be safe and then you can make a decision. So it's to create that space between emotional moment and emotional reaction. And that space is called distress tolerance from uh, DBT. That's great. Emily, would you like to pick up on that? Yeah, I think all, all these things have such wonderful shared threads to them. Um, and I would, I would offer that I have approached this perhaps more in terms of how I relate to those emotions through my body. So um, I think there is a great need to confront risk in order to grow as an individual. And risk, you know, implies great discomfort, great uncertainty, uh, great fear. It's scary. <laughs> so those emotions can also create a freeze in us. And I think that that's, that's one of, we're all being called to action, to be vulnerable, to confront our fragility. We also need to supply people with tools to be able to do that. It's one thing to say it. It's one thing to think it. It's another thing to actually be able to do it. And, um, you know, I think dialectical behavior therapy treads in that space. And I am a big fan personally. I think another tool that I offer up um, that has worked for me in the past is also, you know, it is embodiment to, to call back our conversation. And those things borrow, you know, again, from training and improv, but being able to, to physicalize the emotion allows it also not to be a monster in yourself, right? If you are scared, like you can, you can be scared. You can perform that for yourself. You can perform that for others around you. And it, in doing so, I think it also allows us to create a certain authenticity with ourselves. Um, that a lot, a lot of conflict comes from the repression of those feelings, especially the big ones in our lives. You know, so, um, so being able to manifest them in our bodies and, and to learn how to do that, so um, you know, so it is respectful of others around us. I think is one of the great challenges. That's something. That to work on every day, some days successfully. Those would be ways that personally I have done that, both in, in terms of personal relationships and also in relationship to my own work. And another way to do that is also through the making of stuff, the models of the things, you know, even if they're systems and kind of ephemeral experiences, making something physical, engaging with it physical, we leave, we leave ourselves again, you know, to bring that point back up. So I think that those are the two polls that I would offer up. And Alan, I'm going to ask you, but I also want to say that as educators, I wonder uh, to what extent we need to be more accountable to modeling behaviors that uphold uh, question asking rather than answering. Uh, and I think that if we can model questioning more, we give more of our students and then in professional practice opportunities to have uncomfortable conversations because it's not about answering but asking. So Alan, um, can you respond to, to that? And as I say that, I acknowledge that we only have six minutes left, so we're gonna kind of wind it down after this. Yeah, and, and I wanna acknowledge my privilege in hearing everybody else's answers first. So, um, you know, I, I had the great luck of studying philosophy in undergraduate uh, school. So epistemology and ontology and particularly ethics. And so I feel very lucky that I was able to wrestle with some of these irreconcilable questions um, really early in my you know development as a person and they're irreconcilable or they wouldn't be on the on the agenda in the curriculum of a philosophy education and so dealing with things that were not just problematic but fairly like impossible um, uh, made me 
keen. Um, and actually, I have a lot of hobbies. And if I look at the actual hobbies that I pick, they're all things that are seemingly impossible to do. And I think that's why I'm attracted to them. So from a personal perspective, I choose things. And I think we talked about this earlier in the tape um, that are difficult. Um, so that's my personal answer to, to address the question that you ask for the, as an educator, I think for sure, um, you know, ad nauseum, we talked about that the most important part is the problem finding, not the solution finding. Um, and that sounds, you know, easy and maybe a cliche at this point as a designer, as a practicing designer. It's not a cliche for people who are entering the design profession through an educational venue, through school, um, who have, have not heard this reframe. Um, and I think that that's really, really critical. Um, and then, you know, to teach the individual, to meet people where they are, certain uh, different kinds of people are, you know, in great comfort or in great discomfort, depending on what they bring uh, to, you know, their life experience that they bring into that design like situation, design challenge. It's really, really hard work to be able to quickly figure out what's going to um, stretch them, uh, uh, exercise new muscles, uh, even introduce new muscles. Uh, in a way that is sort of individual specific and not class wide. This is a it's a big question for for educators. I think um, to never sort of take your eye off the ball in that challenge is one of the you know really important things in in being involved in education. So uh, as we are winding down, I would love to give everybody a moment to think about something that's giving them joy right now that they would like to share with the group. And we can do that in silence. We don't actually have to fill the space with chatter. While you were thinking about that, I would ask those of our participants who are still here um, to share that with us as well. And if they're able to either in the Q&A or in the chat to share with us something that is giving you joy right now. Um, and I'm going to hold silence until somebody would like to share. I'm going to say students at SVA because that's real for me. I love them. I feel like they've advanced my practice more than anything. So I'm just feeling a lot of joy about them right now. I'm like bursting. Can I? I don't know where to start. Sorry. <laughs> this is a great prompt, Jennifer. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, there's this, like, well, it's there, right? This horrible Mac clip art, but like the world in this little droplet right now. Um, I'm seeing, like, I'm feeling a lot of the precarity of the world right now. I'm feeling a lot of the, the fear, the worries, I think that we all share. And I'm also filled with like, just the most incredible feelings of generosity, of hope, uh, and therefore of joy of like what we have the possibility to do as a planet. You know, let's not forget that our country also pulled out of the World Health Organization, right? Um, there are lots of stuff going on. And to see the way that humanity is responding right now um, it fills me with like incredible joy. Thank you. This evening, my daughter is graduating from high school um, online. So lots of feelings of joy and pride and, you know, talked about the dichotomies or the dialectics around, you know, sadness and, you know, looking to the future. And um, it's, uh, it's an amazing day. I'm very honored to be on here with all of you today, especially. Uh, and I'm joyful of life, to be alive, breathing, healthy. And thank you, Jennifer, for doing such a great job moderating this. Thank you, Jennifer, really. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to tell you my joy because this is about, this is absolutely pain. I have been trying to relearn how to play the piano. It is so painful, but it is joyous every second of it, every <laughs> bad note. Um, you know, it's and like, are, oh, are you going to, are you going to play us out on this panel? Not like, even. Is it beside no, you? no, no. Okay. Oh. That is not gonna happen. Nobody needs to hear that except for my family and the people who walk by <laughs> on the street. Um, thank you all. I, I really feel very appreciative of all of you to be part of this conversation. And I, and I really, um, I want to make sure that we are continuing to have this conversation because it shouldn't only just be contained within this little bubble of space, 
um, but I think it's part of all of our practice. And I think everybody who is stuck with us through this hour and the hour that came before that was pre-recorded. Um, thank you, Eileen, Armand, New York City, Design Week, all of everything that made this possible. And I wish you all tremendous joy, but also safety and health as you walk out into the world today, because that is not guaranteed. Uh, so thank you all very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you.